thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Dr. Dustin Bird, Professor of Philosophy and Religion at the University of Olivet, also the Editor-in-Chief of Ekparosis Press and the Founder and Co-Director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. Today, we're going to be talking about the culture wars. Politics within the United States is deeply divided. Many analysts believe that outside of the Civil War, the U.S. is more divided now than ever. What fuels much of these divisions are the various culture wars, which are comprised of topics such as LGBTQ plus rights, religion in the public sphere, including public schools, the issue of abortion, what has been called critical race theory, immigration, Black Lives Matter, and the changing demographics of America. In essence, such culture wars are struggles for identity and the light culture that guides that identity. Should America be a Christian nation reflecting the values, beliefs, ideals of the majority religious tradition? Or should it maintain itself as a secular democratic republic wherein one is free to be religious or not? Should America continue to be a majority white country and therefore limit immigration from non-white countries? Or should we embrace the ideal of a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and therefore multi-confessional identity? Should we continue to embrace our Willensgemeinschaft, uh, a willed people brought together by our political ideas a la the U.S. Constitution? Or should we insist on a Volksgemeinschaft, a, a people rooted in pre-political foundations such as shared ethnicity, shared language, shared history, shared religious traditions, etc.? Unlike the traditional right and left, which fought predominantly over political economy, the culture wars reflect the antagonisms between those who see America's future in the cultural past and those who dream of a better American culture in the future. The English phrase culture war is borrowed from the German Kulturkampf, which was originally used to describe the struggles between the Catholic Church in Germany under Pope Pius IX and the Kingdom of Prussia under, under Otto von Bismarck which lasted from 1871 to 1878. This struggle centered around the control over education and ecclesiastical appointments in the Roman Catholic Kingdom of Prussia. In our times, in Germany and in Europe as a whole, it is used to describe any kind of political and or ideological conflict within society, especially as it relates to issues regarding cultural change. This is most poignant in Northern Europe, especially Germany, as it relates to mass immigration, the refugee crisis, and the Americanization of Europe, all what right-wing critics call Volker Chaos, or the chaos of people, and Umvolkung, or deculturation, or what in France is called Le Grand Remplacement, or the Great Replacement. Indeed, backlash to the cosmopolitanization of Europe over individual national cultures, coupled with millions of new Europeans, has led once again to the rise of far-right and or fascist parties in Germany, France, the Netherlands, Italy, Poland, and of course, Orban's Hungary, with its equivalent in the United States with Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. The changing identity of the West is a source of severe unbehagen or uneasiness, which has left many, led many into the fold of right-wing nativist populist leaders, offering easy answers to complex questions. We have with us today Dr. Rudolph J. Siebert, Professor Emeritus of Religion and Society at Western Michigan University, where he taught for over 50 years, published over 30 books, and wrote hundreds of articles and essays. Dr. Siebert is originally from Frankfurt, Germany, where he grew up during the rise of the Third Reich. He later participated in World War II, was a POW in the U.S., was declared an anti-Nazi and sent back to Germany to help in its democratization. He would later return to the U.S. with his family in the early 60s and take a position at Western Michigan University in 1965. He is a critical theorist, a theologian, a dialectical religiologist, and my mentor. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Siebert. You're welcome. So as I stated in my introduction, you grew up in fascist Germany, wherein the culture wars had an intense influence on the rise of the Nazis. Uh, what were the main cultural antagonisms of that time, and, and how did they contribute to the rise of the National Socialists? Well... I may start out with what I experienced there uh, personally. So I was six years old when Hitler came into power, and I was 17 years old when Hitler committed suicide. So um, 12 years I lived under this regime. 
And um, I was part of the Catholic youth movement. I was a leader in the Catholic youth movement. And there had been a concordat, a Reichskonkordat, an empire concordat between Hitler and the Vatican. And that allowed uh, the uh, youth movement, the Catholic youth movement. But then in the first year already of Hitler's regime, they broke the uh, Reichskonkordat. And so the uh, Catholic youth movement then was allowed, but at the same time was persecuted. So my leaders were beaten up. Some of them were killed. Some of them were tortured so that we could not even open up the coffin. And uh, so that is how the Kulturkampf, the uh, culture war, uh, started. So Hitler had uh, done this concorded and had uh, gained recognition, international recognition by it. But as soon as it had uh, fulfilled its purpose, um, he broke it. And so we then had to meet secretly. I took youth groups into the Taunus Mountains and the Gestapo was after us all the time. So um, that was a piece of the new Kulturkampf. Uh, but uh, of course, it started, the Kulturkampf issue started in the second um, German Reich. That means that which Bismarck had uh, founded. And um, the, in 1870, the Germans won the war, the Prussians against France. France had to uh, pay high reparations to Germany, which brought a tremendous economic uh, um, upward movement in Germany. And so during this time, the Protestant Chancellor, Bismarck, a very conservative man, but a very great statesman in a certain way, like Metternich, another conservative statesman, he started this culture war against the Catholic minority in the otherwise Protestant uh, Prussia. So, and that Hitler, in a certain sense, repeated that by after he had founded the Third German Reich, the Third German Empire, and uh, we experienced it in, in this way. Yeah, and so would any of the culture war issues of the Second Reich um, unresolved uh, to the point where they contribute to uh, the turmoil that went on in the Weimar Republic? Or were the culture war issues within the Weimar Republic something native to that time? Well, of course, the situation there was different. We, up to Reagan, we did not really have uh, parties which were concerned with ethical values as such. So, in, but in Germany, we had the center party, which was totally Catholic. So uh, something similar did not exist, exist really in the States. So, um, and this center party was the one which gave Hitler the emergency laws. And the emergency laws made Hitler into a, into a, a, a dictator. And the center party then dissolved itself and they did all this with consent of the, uh, of the Vatican. So, um, that was then uh, the uh, in the later on then in the uh, republic after the um, after the war then we uh, did that again in germany there was the christian democratic union which was founded in hessen and then all over the uh, the german republic so it was again a, a party which had a value system which was uh, Catholic or Protestant. As a matter of fact, uh, I worked with Walter Dirks and Eugen Kogon, and they wanted to have a different Christian Democratic Party, one which would unite the Christians and the workers. But then Adenauer came and threw the workers out and united the Catholic and the Protestant bourgeoisie in his party. But it was a value party. It was than a Catholic Protestant type of uh, party, which was different from the center party. But nevertheless, I think for us, the Kulturkampf issue, the cultural war started really with uh, maybe at the Reagan time, when uh, suddenly these issues like abortion and uh, birth control and all these issues became important for people. And they replaced somehow another concern which was there before, namely the antagonism between the classes, the class war. 
So in order to uh, hide the class war, the Germans used racism. So the Jewish question came up and was overshadowing completely the class struggle, which the fascists did not resolve at all. So um, with us, we, uh, we also, we uh, somehow were hiding um, the class struggle with the race issue, but then with all kinds of other ethical issues like the, uh, the all these issues with the LGBT and, and so on um, that um, moved into the political sphere. Uh, and that was rather new for us, but not really for the Europeans. Yeah, and so issues of like abortion and whatnot might not have been all that important when you first came to the United States in the 1960s because it hadn't quite been politicized yet. So what what were the major important cultural war issues that were going on in the 1960s? Because there certainly was a lot of them. I mean, that was a very... Uh, in the 1960s, uh, there was still very strong in the foreground the class issue. So many of the um, students in the student revolution were Bakuninists, anarchists, or they were Marxists, and they were concerned with the uh, with overcoming the class uh, uh, war by establishing a socialist or even a communistic type of uh, state. So it uh, the that the culture war issues came really up after the sixties, after the seventies, and so on when the Soviet Union was dissolved and when the neoliberal counter-revolution was victorious. Uh, then suddenly these, these culture issues came up. And I think the main function of all the culture issues was to hide the uh, class issue. There was no talk about class anymore or the class struggle. It all became now a value struggle, uh, a culture kampf. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the history of the United States, especially on the issue of abortion and how it was very much depoliticized, but intentionally made into a political issue as a way of, of dividing, especially working class Catholics who predominantly voted the Democratic as opposed to Republican. Uh, but when that became a wedge issue, it cut a lot of Democratic support from the Catholic community, which went to the Republican and became one issue voters. Um, and so do you so you see these the culture wars almost as a strategy as opposed to these are the most important things that we have to deal with in society and you're saying no it, it would be the class antagonism class domination class war but we cover it up we camouflage it with all these other issues but it's not to say that these other issues are important correct uh, yeah they they are important but they were not in the political sphere as such with us but with the Europeans, it was different, so the Germans. So um, with us, this culture issues, these culture issues came uh, just uh, um, after the 60s were over, after the student uh, re revolution had been repressed. Um, then this, um, these culture war issues were definitely a strategy in order to hide what would be most important for us, particularly since the abyss between the ruling power elite, the capitalistic elite, and on the other side, the masses of the people, the abyss became deeper and deeper. But the deeper it became, the more it had to be hidden. And uh, that uh, whole culture talk uh, daily uh, refers to, uh, uh, to the um, abortion issue uh, took its place then. And this abortion issue is very strange because uh, Jesus never talked about abortion. Um, probably he would have been against it, but he talked about homosexuality, but he did not talk about abortion, in spite of the fact that this was a problem at his time, of course, as well. So the question is why then uh, Christians concentrate almost daily, uh, one-sidedly, and this abortion issue not talking at the same time about the death penalty or not talking at the same time about war. Um, there in the, in the Palestine, we have 37,000 people uh, killed in that war and 10,000 children. 
So wherever these wars are, not only embryos, but children <clears throat> are killed at the same time. So it was a very one-sided type of a concern, uh, and it is repeated. It is uh, some kind of a monomanic type of a, of a thing to, uh, to concentrate on this one issue. And um, it is definitely not only a question of morality, but also a question of politics. And uh, so um, Trump uh, now moves also into this anti-abortion thing in order to gain votes. and. Uh, so it has become a uh, political football. Yeah, I remember the former priest, James Carroll, um, who's been laicized, uh, but uh, he's a author and a uh, filmmaker and journalist. And I remember in an interview one time, he said something about the Vietnam War that was especially poignant, where he said that had the Catholic Church um, or had the U.S. military been dropping contraceptives on Vietnam they would have they would have condemned that war but they weren't dropping contraceptives they were dropping napalm and napalm was fine for a large part of the church is that division within the church still here today because obviously we know there was a good portion especially in the 1960s and connected to Vietnam uh, por a good portion of the Catholic Church that condemned that war I'm thinking of the Berrigan brothers and whatnot um, is that division still within the church today? Well, we have a deep division between the conservative Catholicism, which is carried by the Eternal Word uh, television network, uh, mainly, and but by others as well. So um, there is the threat of a schism. Um, we have in that program, we have very often critique of uh, um, of Francis, Pope Francis, and his uh, more open, maybe even democracy inclined uh, Pope uh, with the Solidarity Movement, and um, which which has democratic elements where bishops and laity are voting together and come up with very new ideas. So um, that is, and, and it's astonishingly that. Uh, conservative Catholicism is particularly powerful in the United States and why in such a progressive country we have such a regressive type of Catholicism that is uh, an astonishing uh, contradiction and it is this of course this conservative Catholicism um, which concentrates on these culture issues and particularly on the abortion daily and hourly yeah, maybe it's because of that progressive side of America that there's such a strong backlash and conservative side. You know, like there's one dialectical side pulls this way, the other one strengthens and pulls that way. I mean, it, that's one possibility. Um, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I seem to remember that Pope Francis has, I mean, since he was uh, elected in 2013, he's made a lot of statements on what would we consider culture war issues that seem to have angered or at least dismayed a lot of the conservative side of the church, such as when he was asked about LGBTQ folks and and uh, their moral standing, do they go to heaven? He said, who am I to judge? Um, which I think, uh, you know, if you were on the more conservative side, people were expecting him to say, no, it's morally wrong. You know what I mean? This is a, a major sin. It'll send you to hell. But he didn't. He said, who am I to judge? Yeah, and he said hell was empty. Well, that's a very optimistic view. But I think what I mean when, when I say democratically inclined is his inclusiveness. So I think what is the object of uh, the attacks from the conservative side is this immense inclusiveness. He wants to include uh, comical people and he wants to include politicians. The first time appeared in this meeting of the Seven Nations. Uh, seven democratic nations of which nations uh, he uh, gave a speech there about artificial intelligence and so on so it is his inclusiveness and therefore his democratic tendencies which are um, suspicious to the conservatives they go close to even that he may come to to the borderline of heresy and, and so on so some would go that far 
there are even cardinals who are in opposition to this. So I think the focus point is really inclusiveness. He wants to have a truly Catholic church, that means which would be Catholic, which means universal, which would include all the people, at least be open for all the people and be in touch with all the people. And that is, of course, the council. So uh, he does not do anything new. He just uh, fights for what the council, the progress the council had made. And sometimes he goes a little bit further than what the council has, uh, has said. And what these conservatives have done at a certain point, they opposed the council or they reinterpret the council. They reinterpret the council in such a way as if it had brought not, not, nothing new at all. Uh, while, of course, the other side was so hopeful because the council did open up some windows to the world. Yeah, I seem to remember that, that Ratzinger was very much a part of Vatican II as a, an advisor, the theological advisor, and that he became very much dismayed with the, I mean, you can't really say the consequences, but he became dismayed with certain aspects of the church and its embrace of as we were talking about the 1960s in the issues of class consciousness and class war, but that that somehow led him into a very conservative side of the church, where he then embraced a very conservative side of the culture wars. And it seems to me that that Pope Francis today is, like you said, he he's an almost like an extension and embodiment of, of Vatican II, which is open to these issues, open to the others, Although he's not like a, I mean, people call him a liberal. I don't, I don't see anything very liberal about him. He's like you said, he's open, he's inviting, he's inclusive. Um, but it seems like Francis himself has become an issue of the culture war. Yeah. But he has become an issue because um, he is the incarnation of what was ever, what was new in the uh, council and uh, he wants to push that through. So there's the little issues like, or maybe not so little, there's the issue of the Latin mass. And uh, so the conservatives would like to have the Latin mass back or that it uh, can be celebrated everywhere and so on. And the Pope was very strict. He made some, maybe de determined that one church maybe may, may celebrate the Latin mass and but the others had to follow the council and so on. So, that is uh, where the issue, uh, where, where the struggle, the culture war inside of the Catholic Church uh, is burning. And it is a very dangerous thing. And um, he said, oh, wait, the Pope, he doesn't want to have another Protestant church in Germany. So, but um, there are tendencies in the solidarity, solidarity movement uh, which uh, hopefully will not bring about another schism <clears throat> between those who take the council seriously and want to go beyond the council and those who think that the council brought nothing new at all. Yeah, and in today's age too, especially, it seems like the culture wars are driven much by social media um in social media how it's being driven on social media is also reflected on in mainstream media especially on things like fox news or you mentioned ewtn how do these type of outlets fuel the flames of, of the culture wars well i think uh, that both of these stations fox news and uh, uh, the eternal word which are very closely connected even uh, arroyo uh, Raymond Arroyo is uh, employed by both of them, the same man that in Nazi Germany that never went so far, um, that the same man is in both stations and uh, plays an important role in both of them. Um, so uh, it is, of course, what they say all the time is that all our misery comes from Marxism and uh, all this Marx comes up again in Marxists everywhere and and Biden is uh, is a socialist, or Biden is a communist, and so uh, fascist movements, of course, um, rescue operations for capitalism, and that is where why Trump uh, is paid so much by the billionaire class now, and has this tremendous uh, um, treasure there, 
which he can use for his legal fees and also for for his advertisement, for his running for office again. So um, the um, ruling class uh, likes Trump, of course, and uh, will support him. And um, because fascist movements or authoritarian movements would like to uh, to stay with the uh, uh, capitalistic system. And uh, therefore, the whole war issue, too, um, Roosevelt had the New Deal and tried to overcome the disaster of the Great uh, um, uh, Repression, Depression. And, uh, but it didn't really work. What worked was the war. And so they gained this great insight that war is the most powerful anti-depression measure one can possibly have. And so we had about 25 wars since 1945. Uh, it uh, keeps the um, factories going, the uniforms and the rockets and the tanks and all that is very expensive stuff. And um, so one has to keep that going. And of course, the worker take part in it too, because they have jobs. And uh, so part of the workers then have jobs and the others are fighting or let other people fight, which is even better. So um, that is something which has come through and is not discussed very much um, why we are involved in one war after the other. And when one is cl closed in Afghanistan, another one opens up in, in the Ukraine or another one opens up in, in, the, the, in the Middle East and so on. So there's no end to it. There's no end to those wars. <coughs> and one important function of these wars is that it keeps us, of course, uh, it keeps uh, the, the uh, controls the depressive tendencies, then, of course, when you don't have a depression, you have an inflation. So then you have to settle with the inflation, but the inflation is more bearable than a depression is. And so the war has become very important. And if we try for our center for uh, um, peace research, it's very hard for us to find a businessman with a conscience who would say, yes, we should explore the causes of war and remove them and so on, because war is such an, a tremendously profitable affair for almost everybody. We are not innocent. We pay taxes and we are part of the whole system. <clears throat> so um, that is the present situation. Yeah, and war, it, when we're intimately involved with it, it, it seems like it's one of those few things, or maybe like a national crisis like 9-11, but war obviously happens more often than a terrorist attack. Uh, it seems like one of those things that where we can temporarily set aside the culture wars because we reunite on this issue. So when we have that outside, that external uh, target of our internal negativity, um, we can focus all of our attention there, but as soon as that is gone and we're not intimately involved in a war, like the war in Iraq, for instance, um, then we turn on ourselves and the culture wars get heated up. And, and, and this is a whole Hegelian idea, right, that, that you need war is not, he says, not entirely evil because it unites people and reminds them why the state's important and things like that. But as soon as that external threat goes away, the threat of within the the body politic in and of itself becomes more um, becomes more acute. Yeah, well, Hegel even thought it would keep civil society healthy to have a war here and there. So, but uh, on the opposite, he thought at his time, by eighteen thirty, that the European nations should not have any wars anymore because it was too late that Europe was on the way to retirement. And that one should not have, there was no need for new wars and so on. So, uh, yes, but even the war, which people th thought that it would unite uh, civil society, the two wars which are going on now in the Middle East and in the Ukraine do not really unite people. As a matter of fact, they are split about both of them. So some of them want to send more money to the Ukraine and others don't want to send any money to the Ukraine. And some of them protest on the side of Hamas and the other protests on the side of Israel. So uh, not even the the wars, you, you may say in Hegelian terms that the wars are not big enough in order to 
uh, reunite us all. So, and hopefully it will not get bigger. We must find other ways to come together with each other. Yeah, those two wars are, are you know, where the state, the American state's involved, intimately involved in both of them, but the American people aren't seemingly involved in them. We're not sending soldiers over and, and participating in combat. Um, and there was no threat to us directly yeah. with either of them. So yeah, they're not, they're not they're not as intimate as they would need to be in order to be a, some kind of force of unification. Um, you had mentioned also okay. the two parties, and so the republic may, may be inclined more um, in one way, and the democrats in another way. So the whole political system is involved. Yeah, very and very much the culture wars are driving that. You know, Russia, for instance, I just wrote a paper on this. Russia projects to the world that it is the, or Putin specifically, um, that it is the champion of traditionalism, of traditional ways of being, of the traditional family and traditional Christianity and in uh, the West, Europe, and especially the United States is the attack on the tradition, the attack on the family, that the the um, uh, wokeism, and he even talks about wokeism, just like our Republicans talk about wokeism, that it, it wants to, you know, destroy the family and destroy society and, and completely secularize and take out religion. And you have a lot of conservatives who hear that same type of rhetoric. They like that type of rhetoric. They heard it out of Donald Trump. The same, because I mean, Donald Trump just, it's a strategy for him. He doesn't care about the traditional family one bit, but nevertheless, um, they heard it from Trump. And so even outside countries are playing a part or force in our culture wars. So oftentimes with the protests, the um, anti-Biden protests, uh, anti-Black Lives Matter protests, you'll hear people say better to be Russian than to be a Democrat or something like this, right? Or better to be with Putin than to be with, with Biden. Putin is uh, is the champion of Christianity and Biden is the antichrist. <laughs> I mean, it's all these very strange things, but um, it comes up on and on and, and over and over again. In, in Trump, I think in his election in 2016 and even maybe less so now because he's more per, he's more focused on personal grievance but in the 2016 election he used a lot of these culture war issues as a means of peeling off disaffected democrats to his side of the uh his side and so i mean he he pulled people from both the democrats and the republicans uh and a lot of it was through these culture war issues yeah i mean <clears throat> that story is of course <clears throat> if these values are really meant, if really people know what these values really are, if they are really concerned with what the fathers of the constitutions emphasized, that a democracy can function only with, uh, with, with uh, virtuous people, that means people who are prudent, who are just, who are chaste, who are brave, or who are faithful and hopeful and loving. Um, and and then the fathers of the constitution knew, of course, that there are no virtuous people. So the question was, where do they come from? And it was the family and was the church which was supposed to educate them. And so um, the problem is now Trump, uh, of course, is not a real virtuous person at all, and he has many vices. And the uh, uh, Christian nationalists they say, well. Sometimes God works through evil people, and uh, there's uh, many examples in, in the uh, uh, Hebrew Bible. And uh, so, this uh, uh, therefore they are following him in spite of the fact that he is not a virtuous person <coughs> and make our situation only worse. Yeah, I remember things like the the flag um at football games with colin kaepernick you know and colin was taking a knee as he was um advised to do by a former u.s special forces um soldier and instead of sitting down during the national anthem this other guy this other uh former military man who played in the nfl advised him to take a knee because that's what military does when something is wrong you're honoring something but you're also sending a signal something's wrong in case 
someone was injured, someone was killed in, in combat, whatever it is. Um, but somehow taking a knee to say something's wrong in American society that so many young black men are being murdered by the police or being killed by the police or being treated at, at minimum unjustly by the police, that somehow became a culture war issue of we own the flag, the flag is ours, you, you, the other people, in this case a black athlete, are, are disrespecting our flag by taking a knee during the national anthem instead of seeing it how Kaepernick saw it which was, no, I'm pointing out that American citizens are being treated unjustly and being killed. And Trump took that, brought it right into the culture wars, and basically, in many ways, racialized it. And it was, these Black athletes and their supporters are disrespecting your flag, and of course, your meant white America, right? Your yeah. flag. And it was a strategy, and it worked. Yes. You know, I mean, you get things like that. And then uh, on top of the economic issues that um, that Trump brought up, which in many cases, the reason why a lot of liberals moved to his side is because he did talk about the the carnage I mean, in his uh, inauguration address, the carnage of of the working class. Right. That we have the Rust Belt because all these factories are gone. They went to China and he offered him an alternative of I, as the strong man, if you elect me, will bring them back. I mean, that was music to the ears of these disaffected people uh, that he could do that, that he would bring them back their jobs, which meant bring them back their dignity, right? bring them back their, their sense of responsibility, especially for men, that they could take care of their families and things like that. Um, now, of course, it was complete and utter nonsense, but well, when you do yeah, that whole have a, grievance, it works. Yeah. We have a similar situation like we had in, in Germany then. So the workers think that right-wing people are really revolutionaries and uh, they like this revolutionary talk. But in reality, they are they're counter-revolutionaries. That means they do not want to have a post-capitalistic society or something new, but they want to have to preserve that what what it is what is. So that misunderstanding that Trump may be a revolutionary person, I am the voice of the voiceless and all this, um, but in reality he is not uh, he's, he's not a, a, a revolutionary, but he's a counter-revolutionary type of a guy who. Uh, with many others, fights against uh, the left with its uh, Marxist ideas or whatever. So, or even B Bernie Sanders, just the uh, like we have it in Northern Europe, the type of social democratic type of movements, people who do not remove the billionaire class but are taxing them and use the tax money then in order to support the working class issues like free. Uh, free schools or free uh, uh, healthcare or whatever we have in Norway or in Denmark and Sweden and uh, Germany and so on. <laughs> so um, that that misunderstanding there that right wingers are or authoritarian guys are revolutionaries and, uh, and and instead of seeing that they are really counter revolutionary and we are in a neoliberal counter-revolutionary uh, situation. The uh, then inner revolution was uh, dismantled. Um, so the counter-revolution was victorious. And we are still in that, uh, in that time span where this victory continues. It will not be forever, but it is the present. Yeah, and it, it, Trump's functionalization of, of religion was extremely appalling. Um, you know, it's this restoration politics that as you talked about with, you know, God can use evil people for good things like like Cyrus, despite the fact that Cyrus really wasn't an evil person. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, somehow the left and their secular politics and their LGBTQ politics and um, you know, in, in their transgenderism, in their uh, transhumanism, and all these things they want to get rid of, their postmodernism, that's destroying America. And I'm going to stop that and, and restore 
um, Christianity in America. Christianity and, and Christians, you know, it always, as Trump would say, getting it from right-wing Christians, that they're the victims in America, that they're under attack. And he's going to stop that and he's going to restore them. And we're going to put prayer back in the White House and all this stuff. I mean, for him, he couldn't care less about that. I mean, these people are a joke for him. Um, but he used it. And he used the culture wars as a means to, to get to, into power in 2016. And it worked. And it worked well. The question then becomes, will it work again in 2024? What do you think? Well, it will depend on the American people if it will work or not. And um, there is a good chance that it will work again. The functionalization of uh, religion and uh, ethical values uh, is, of course, a thing of long standing. And one has to be careful. One cannot simply say it will always be functionalized. One has to see, you know, if Trump uh, is a Presbyterian, to what extent is he really Presbyterian? Or Putin is an Orthodox? How much is he really? Is it, by the way, can we always say it is always an abuse of religion? Or what if some of those people are really religious? It could be the case. All human beings are religious in a certain way. So, so if one enters that struggle, one has to be careful if some party or some leader or whatever, uh, if they mean it or if they don't mean it. And by their works, you will easily see it if it is meant well or not. Yeah, just recently, uh, Louisiana, I think it was the Supreme Court of Louisiana, said it was perfectly legal for public schools to put the Ten Commandments in the schools because it's a tradition to do that. Um, you know, and, and it's, that's driven by conservative Christians. And, you know, as a dialectician, the first thing I think of is, yeah, put the Ten Commandments in, in the schools and then live by those Ten Commandments, at least the moral ones, the first few are theological, but maybe the moral ones. Um, and what would happen to society if society, including conservatives, lived by those Ten Commandments? Your capitalism is gone. <laughs> with with all the stealing it's gone right you know with the lying what would happen to politics if they actually live by thou shalt not lie or thou shalt not covet i mean it's a the ten commandments would be a real revolution in society but it wouldn't be one that the conservatives would like right so i mean there is always this triangle there at first it's stealing and when one cannot really steal, then it's killing, and then it's the lying over the stealing and the killing, that there is no stealing and killing, etc. So that is, this horrible uh, negative trinity is always played out again. So, um, yes, of course, uh, uh, and if you sum them up, the Ten Commandments, that would be the golden rule. And the golden rule, almost all religions have it, and even in secular form, it appears so nobody can really say that something strange is imposed on people. They all have it already. So the it's not a real imposition. So there are other states which want to do that as well. So, but uh, it uh, violates in a certain sense the separation of church and state. Um, and there we have the split again. People who follow the constitution and that means the bourgeois enlightenment really and uh, others who want to stay with this traditional traditional value. So whatever step we make, it always splits us again. Yeah, that the, the idea that has been articulated quite often lately that the separation of church and state is not really a thing in the Constitution is uh, quite laughable, uh, considering the, the very First Amendment to the uh, Constitution that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It's right here in the First Amendment. Yet, that's part of the question is, okay, fine, the state doesn't get involved in, in imposing religion on people, but what conservatives are now saying on the conservative side of the culture wars is that, so the state doesn't do that to the churches, but the churches should be able to impose their beliefs on the state through their elected representatives and whatnot. And that is obviously 
you know, going behind the bourgeois revolution because democratic will formation is done in secular language or secular terms in secular constitutional states. Uh, and to somehow introduce that the Bible says, or the Quran says, or the Bhagavad Gita says, and therefore that ought to be the rule or the law of the land would certainly be um, going well behind the bourgeois revolution, of which our constitution comes out of. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking about this, this secularization, you know, the West, in terms of the civilization of the West, of which the United States obviously is a part, uh, it continues on what Habermas calls the Sonderweg or the, the deviant path regarding secularization, that it continues its secularizing path, although he says we're in a post-secular state, which basically means there's a change of consciousness, we no longer understand or believe or think that religion is going to disappear ultimately, as we thought in traditional secularization theory, but therefore religion will continue to have a place, but it is not the dominant place within Western society. Um, what do you think, in terms of the culture wars and religion, what do you think the ultimate fate of religion and religious communities will be within the West? Well, so we have a certain shift from these class issues, uh, class antagonism, to the antagonism between the religious and the secular, which means really between the religious and the enlightenment. And the Enlightenment, already the bourgeois Enlightenment, but then also the Marxist and the Freudian Enlightenment, are indeed um, a very serious attack on religion. And um, people who are afraid that re religion would suffer more even than it has already, they uh, see something there. So one should not underestimate um, the power of the Enlightenment. It is true that it was only in Europe, but then spread to America. And But in the meantime, it has spread around the whole globe. But it is also true that where it has not spread, let's say in Africa and so on, that is where how today the priests are coming from, or from India. We, we have Indian and, and uh, priests uh, because we have not our own priests any longer. So it means no priests come from the, the uh, enlightened territories, but they all come from the not yet enlightened territories. And that shows us that um, the um, these conservative people are right, that the enlightenment is more powerful than one may think it is. And it works in people and it has its effects. And it is, of course, not always understood rightly. So the Enlightenment may enter the dialectics of Enlightenment. It may, the Enlightenment may contradict itself and so on. So, and we see some of these effects around us. There are some things are really wild. So, um, but I think one should not underestimate um, the power of the Enlightenment and um, it poses danger for all world religions as soon as this type of thinking, that means the whole issue of autonomy, the autonomy of the human conscience, which of course, uh, Thomas Aquinas would say that on Judgment Day, we will not be uh, judged according to the teaching of the church, but according to our conscience. There you have an enlightenment, even in the high middle ages, this bourgeois enlightenment stuff already started. And it will not end. It will not simply stop or so. So we have to be prepared for this. And the question is, what solution? And one solution is what the critical theory and the Frankfurt School recommended. And that is a translation, a translation of uh, religious values into the Enlightenment. As it has happened, of course, so the labor unions, they change the brotherly love or the love of the neighbor into solidarity. So, and they already the bourgeois enlightenment, the issue of democracy, democracy includes equality, it includes freedom, it includes brotherhood and sisterhood. These are all values which were religious ones and have already been translated by the bourgeois revolution more so even by the Marxist revolution. 
and um, which simply broadens the issue. That means that when Hegel says everybody has a right to poverty, his socialist students said, okay, we have to see that everybody has the right of poverty, really. That also those who produce the poverty, namely the workers, must also have the right of poverty. And so, on. And so that we have to have shared poverty. And so um, there is um, the Enlightenment has already continually translated religious value. It has rejected the um, reactionary elements in the religions, their cooperation with slavery and feudalism and capitalism, but has at the same time also rescued some of their values, like, for instance, our idea of the always more perfect union is definitely rooted in Christianity. And also the equality issue when Paul sends the slave back, what says to the slaveholder, He's your brother now. That undermines the whole slave, slave system of the Roman Empire and is, is more effective than Spartacus, so, um, who was crucified with 10,000 other slaves on the Via Appia Antiqua. So, um, the, uh, the, your question and uh, our question is who will win? And um, I think religion will survive but it will not survive in the form in which it is now. So we have this Eucharistic Congress going on in Indianapolis where believers um, march thousands of them through the streets with the monstrance and the bread in the monstrance and in order to prove, to prove what? What they really prove is that thousands of people believe this but it does not prove that the belief is true. There is a difference between those two. And it is, when one traces it back, it started around a thousand or so, when the first time Christians began to doubt if Christ was really present in the bread and the wine. And then the Corpus Christi uh, celebration came up and these processions with the monsters, as we have it now in Indianapolis. and. Uh, but it proved at that time that they are believers, but not that they believe is true. And that is again the case today. So how effective will it be for all the nuns who uh, the, have no religion whatsoever and are growing in numbers? Um, so the, uh, I'm quite sure that the religions in the form in which they exist now cannot survive. But I think that the best of them could survive by being translated into, into the Enlightenment movements. And Habermas's point is that this has to be that way. That means without transcendence, the human mind would degenerate. Uh, the human mind needs transcendence, needs a totally other in order not to, to, not to uh, disintegrate. So um, that he wrote this wonderful two volume work about the philosophy of uh, religion and um, he did not become a believer, Habermas. And uh, so also Adorno, his teacher, was not a believer. So they say, non credo, I don't believe. But they are open, Adorno and Habermas wait for a better revelation for a revelation with less contradictions. So um, there are certain requirements they have about um, religion and the conf religious confusion, um, of course, is disturbing. And when Jesus says, be united, because otherwise it's, it's the truth will suffer. Well, we have all been divided and the truth has suffered. <clears throat> and um, this has to be overcome, of course, if religion should survive. It may die because of the Enlightenment attacks, but also because, more so, because of its internal contradictions, which it cannot handle. So Putin is a, uh, orthodox. The Orthodox and the Romans were one. 
up to the year 1000 and so on. And then they got in trouble over the icons. And they have not been able for a thousand years to come together. And how then can they, when they could not come together themselves, can they now make peace in the Ukraine or can make peace in 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 central uh, in 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 the Middle East and so so uh, <clears throat> so the churches have to reflect on themselves and their own history and their own misery and to what what extent they have really followed Mohammed or have really followed Jesus or have really followed Buddha and so on or to what what extent they are guilty of their own demise because of this unfaithfulness. And that comes to its extreme in these political struggles where religion is used and you never know if they mean it or not. Yeah, that the evangelicals in America tied themselves so tightly to Donald Trump, who for millions of other Americans represents brutality. I mean, the think of the the brutal system of separating children from their parents, the the uh, undocumented who are trying to get into the country. If they get caught, they separate the children. I mean, it, it just that is as brutal as it comes. As a father of five, I can't imagine that. Um, you know, or the the racism or the the uh, prejudice. You know, the Muslim ban or the attack on um, minority voices. You know. Uh, and so when they tied their religious beliefs so closely to a guy who, I mean, embodies all the seven deadly sins basically on every day, <laughs> you know, for a lot of non-religious people who would be open to discussing with them things like compassion and hope and charity and all these good things that come out of religion, it, it just, it, it becomes tribal. No, you're religious. This is you represent backwardness, brutality, hatred, and we are over here with our secular worldviews, which is compassionate and merciful and things like that. Despite the fact that they both have them within them, but they won't talk to each other. You're right. But if you take just one story, the story of the Good Samaritan, there's a fellow, a Samaritan, and he finds that Jewish guy who has been beaten up on the street between Jericho and Jerusalem, and. Uh, he is another race, he is another culture, but he breaks this Good Samaritan, he breaks through all these uh, walls of race and whatever and religion and helps him and puts him on his uh, horse or on donkey or whatever and takes him to the next inn and pays for him and so on. He's a wonderful symbol, so you could say that is Christianity. But what the exclusive authoritarians do is exactly the opposite. And that may be in the name of Jesus. And that is, of course, horrifying. Right. And that seems to be what, at least from what I can see, Pope Francis is trying to break. Exactly. Through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that about wraps it up for our time. Dr. Siebert, it's been a wonderful discourse on uh, the culture wars, and there's a lot more stuff we could talk about, and but we'll save that for maybe our next uh, our next session. So let's end with the Good Samaritan. End with the Good Samaritan. That's a good place to end. Very good. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much.